maybe we're feeling pressured because we got to get out the door. We have an appointment or, we, you know, we have, <laughs> we have to be somewhere. Um, or we had an argument with our spouse or we're tired. Like all of those reasons will feed into why we aren't our best selves. You know, at other times when we're feeling better, we'll handle those moments more gracefully. So, th so there's a connection between how people feel and how people behave. So if we want to help kids to behave better, it can help to pay attention first to how they feel. You are listening to the Mindful Mama podcast episode 320. Today we're talking about how to talk when little kids won't listen with Joanna Faber and Julie King. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast now with over a million downloads. Here it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you've calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of Mindful Parenting, and I'm the author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome back to the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so glad to be connecting with you today. Thanks to my, to my lovely daughter, Sora, who is 11, for helping me do this intro today. And if you listen to the very end, you can hear a little bit more of Sora. <laughs> this is an amazing episode. I love talking to Joanna Faber and Julie King. They have so many great things to say. They're masters of how to communicate with little kids. So today, that's who we're talking to, the authors of the best-selling book, How to Talk So Little Kids Will Listen. And we're going to talk about their new book, How to Talk When Little Kids Won't Listen. Together, they demystify the common reasons why kids don't listen and expertly navigate us through several common scenarios using playfulness, empathy, and sometimes just taking a few breaths. So if you have ever wondered like, how many times do I have to ask my child to do something before it ever gets done, ever, ever, this is the episode for you. I know it is going to be a powerful one. Of course, everything we talk about in this episode, being able to respond in these skillful ways depends upon us being able to calm our reactivity, to be able to understand and take care of unconscious triggers so they aren't popping up, to be able to manage our own emotions in difficult parenting situations. And that's what the Mindful Parenting course does expertly and leads you through that. That is the whole first half of the Mindful Parenting course because everything Joanna and Julie talk about depends upon you being able to access your whole brain so you can parent well. And that is often the missing piece. If Joanna and Julie's book, it's not working for you, this might be the missing piece. So if you would like to know more, we have the lifetime membership in mindful parenting, which includes, you know, 36 hours of live parent coaching a year. And you get that for a lifetime. So you get hours and hours and hours of live parent coaching from me and my certified mindful parenting coaches, you know, so you can ask your questions on any subject, any situation. And also then like when your kids are older, you get to ask those other questions that pop up because I promise you <laughs> those questions don't stop coming. So if you would like to know more, go to mindfulparentingcourse.com and get on the waitlist and we will let you know when we open the doors next time. And we have an affordable self-study option now as well. So that is there for you at mindfulparentingcourse.com. All right. I think that's all I have to say today. Join me at the table as I talk to Joanna Faber and Julie King. So excited to talk to you about your new book, which I really enjoyed. I spent some time at the pool reading how to talk when kids won't listen. So I'm just excited because, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like you had a lot in how to talk so little kids will listen. So now we'll kind of dive into maybe what was left over. But what are the what are some of the I would guess that my first question that I'd love to ask you is like, what are some of the reasons why kids won't listen? Because you're this is, you know. Why do they why do they ignore 
our requests and, and all that stuff? Why aren't they listening to us? Well, there's lots of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with one. Kids don't like to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. they, they don't want us to say, put that down, get your shoes on, we're going, uh, 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 you know, not, you know, no more playing. They, they don't like to be told what to do. And it's a dilemma for us because there's so many things we need them to do, right? All day long. Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, I'm answering your question literally, why don't they listen to us? Because they don't want to sometimes. <laughs> well, no one likes to be, have commands barked at them like all day long, right? Like if you're a two-year-old, your life is like, you know, eat breakfast, put away your bowl, put your shoes on, brush your teeth, put your, you know, it's like a constant yeah. string of orders, really. You forgot, get down off of there. Get down right? off of there. Of course, yeah. there's that one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stop pulling your sister's hair, yeah. all of those things. So it's just like constant stream of orders and no one likes to like yeah. be ordered around, I guess. Not at any age. I don't. Yeah, and they don't see the point of it. Like, why do we have to wash our hands? I, I, <laughs> They're like, I did that yesterday and the day before. It's enough already. I, I've mastered that. I want a different challenge. <laughs> They're slightly clean, right? <laughs> I remember when my son was two, my oldest was two, and it was time for dinner. And we did have this expectation that everybody washed their hands before dinner. And he, I said, you know, time to wash your hands. And he said, no. <laughs> I remember thinking, my first thought was, well, don't wash your hands. Don't eat dinner. And then I thought, Hmm, how is that going to go with a two-year-old, <laughs> hungry two-year-old, you know, battle of wills. So I had to switch tactics. And, I, you know, we talk a lot about being playful. I, I decided that was the best strategy for a two-year-old. And I said, and he was really into Sesame Street. So I said, you know what, Asher? Actually, I used to say that a lot when I had no idea what I was going to say. Was just stalling for time. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> but I said, a good tactic. What? Stall for time. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, okay, he likes Sesame Street. He's been to Big Bird. I said, I heard that Big Bird is has escaped from Sesame Street and he's hiding in kids' bathrooms. Should we shall we go and look in our bathroom to see if he's there? And Asher says, Big Bird in the bathroom. Of course, now we run to the bathroom and he looks around. Is he there? No, I don't see him. I said, Well, look in the sink. Is he there? No, turn the water on. Maybe you could catch him. And now at this point, he knows it's a game. So we're playing, looking for a big bird. He's not in the water. We check the soap, not in the soap, <laughs> try the water again. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's in the towel. He's not anywhere. Well, maybe he's at the dining room table. No, not there either. I guess we'll just eat dinner. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, th that became the activity of the evening before dinner because washing hands was just too boring. So he needed, yeah. he needed me to spice it up a little. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, w one of our top skills that we really emphasize in the book is, is to use playfulness. And, and I think, you know, we, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that, you know, kids live in a world where they learn through play and they experience the world through play and they interact through play. And we adults live in the world of do this, do that, hurry up, hurry up. And we often don't feel very playful. Um, but, so we give parents a lot of examples of how you, other parents have used playfulness in a lot of particular situations. And, and it just, you know, not, not only does it get things done, but it, it lightens the mood and it makes people feel connected and it makes people feel cooperative. So that's, that's one of our, our skills that we that we um, have a lot of material on. Yeah. And, and oh, I, I just wanted just to go on a little tangent here when you say, why don't kids listen? Another reason why kids sometimes don't listen is just because they're involved and they're concentrating on something else and we want a response. And if you think of how you would want to be talked to as an adult, you know, say I came up to you, Hunter, when you were preparing for your next podcast. And I said, Hunter, Hunter, you know, I'm, I'm going to the deli. You know, what do you want? Do you want a ham on rye? And, 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 you know, you're busy, you're concentrating, you're trying to finish your sentence. I was like, Hunter, I need an answer now. Hunter, are you listening to me? Hunter, Hunter, Hunter. Um, I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> Joanna, you know, enough. Uh, right. Stop. <laughs> um, right. and, and, you know, so if you think about it, you know, we, as adults, you would probably rather I say something to you like, 
you know, Hunter, I, I can see you're busy. I have a question for you when you're ready. And then you could say to me, okay, let me just finish this sentence or, mm-hmm. you know, I need five minutes. Uh, and we often don't uh, extend that same respect to kids because whatever they're busy with, we don't consider that of, of vital importance. But to kids, their, their work is play and it's just as important to them as our work is to us. So, you know, yeah. if we can approach a kid and say, I, I used to say to my son, you know, Dan, uh, I have a question for you when you're ready. Because otherwise he wouldn't look up. I mean, people, I've had many people ask me, have you had his hearing checked? Because when <laughs> I would say his name, he wouldn't twitch. You know, he had great powers of concentration. But if I said, if I said, you know, Dan, I have a question, you know, let me know when you're ready to hear it. I could sort of see it working on him. He's curious now. He wants to know what I'm going to say. And, you know, so then in, in a few seconds, he'd look up and say, I'm ready. What's your question? Which I is love that. <laughs> I love it because you're like modeling this great respect for him and his important work as a kid, whatever age he's doing, whatever. You're modeling this important, this respect for him. And then, you know, sometimes our, we wonder like, you know, parents ask me all the time about disrespect and we wonder why our kids are not respectful of us. But like, if we Mm. are going around all day saying, what, come stop that, come pick up your shoes, (laughs) climb down off there, put up, you know, if we're barking orders all day long, it's not a very respectful way to treat a person, even if they're a small person, I guess. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's, and and uh, if you think of those words coming out of their mouths, um, for you, it's it's not going <laughs> to fly, right? No you know, but you know, in our in our own defense, you know, we're under stress. You know, we have to, mm-hmm. you know, get kids to do so many things and get them out in the morning and get them to bed at night and get them fed. So you know, it's it's easy to lose sight of that, which is one of the reasons that it's nice to sometimes look at a book and read a lot of stories and examples of of what other people are doing because it helps refresh us. Yeah. Yeah. That whole, the our ability to be able to t- take care of ourselves and, mm. and to be able to have enough uh, bandwidth to be able mm. to think creatively, yeah. to be playful, that all underlies all of this. So, you know, I talk in the podcast about, you know, mindfully taking care of ourselves and that's something we do a lot and and that underlies all this but let's go back to the original question so like why aren't kids listening they're not listening because we're barking orders they're not not listening because they're busy involved Mm. with with things so let me me point out that mm -hmm. that for kids who are on the spectrum shifting attention is a challenge it it, you know it's i think it's a challenge for a lot of kids and especially for 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 kids on the spectrum so if we understand their neurology then i think it it, i'll speak for myself it gave me more understanding and patience under knowing that what seemed like a simple thing for me to to go and say hey rashi you know what do you want for lunch do you want a turkey sandwich or you want peanut butter and jelly that was I thought I'm not, all he has to do is for a second, tell me, but for him to shift his attention from, he was deeply engrossed in something and thinking, thinking about something for him to stop and focus on me and focus on this completely different question was it take, took an effort. So, you know, as you said, we have to take care of ourselves. I I, I was telling Joanna, when, when I used to do stuff like this with him, I used to actually go in and say, Hey, Rashi. And then I would pause and wait for him for that for his name to possibly enter his consciousness and then say i would say something similar like you know i have a question for you when you're ready and then i would start to count because i needed to do something for myself because i knew it was going to be 10 or 20 seconds which doesn't sound like a lot when i say the numbers but it's actually a long time to wait in a conversation it's a really long time you know so i think understanding what that challenge is for kids is also for me it was very helpful to you know to be able to to manage that for myself you know, I, I listened to a podcast where someone was, oh, who was I? I forget. It was a, uh, so she was a sociologist or psychologist. She studied the way in communication that p- different people, the amount of like, kind of one of the things they studied in recording all these conversations was the amount of pause time in oh, between yeah. responding. And mm. so she discovered that she and like her partner were like New Yorkers. They lived in New York and there was like zero pause time. Like they just like talked right over each other. And that was considered 
that's just the norm. That's considered showing interest and being, uh, you know, an interested, you know, polite yeah. person. And, but they were in at a dinner conversation with people from like, it was either California or some other country. California. I heard the same one. Yes. Yes, California they, or some other country, <laughs> other country like California, and they were like they didn't get a word in edgewise because they just had these differences in pause, and and this was this was adults who couldn't oh. who couldn't figure this out. You know what I mean? Who who just kind of thought, oh, that person's a little cold or that person's oh. a little rude or whatever it is, and so we, we there are these unspoken assumptions that we have even as adults that we don't realize. And then when we come into it with kids, I love how you're saying 10 or 20 seconds because yeah, that's an enormously long time. And for us, we don't realize that our assumption is like, we come from this soup of like uh, authoritarian culture. So our assumption is like that we, we unquestioned assumption that we may not even realize is like instant obedience. Like we we kind of expect that from kids and you're you're inviting us to say, pause for 10 or 20 seconds, it, you know, that can bring up all kinds of stuff for people. It's really a radical um, invitation. I love it. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. We are supported by Pros, and I'm so thrilled because there really is no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hair care, a product that works wonders for curls, might make straight hair limp and greasy. My daughter Maggie has like thin, fine hair and she can't use the same hair products that I use and my other daughter use. So that's why I love Pros. It is not mass hair care designed for the masses with, you know, just a few ingredients that are intended for as many people as possible. It's custom hair care designed for the individual, for you, you as an individual, products that are literally made differently for everybody and they're continually improving and evolving with you over time, which is so cool. Basically, Pro's hair care is much more effective because of this personal natural ingredients with proven results. They customize every product in your routine from your shampoo to supplements. And the way they do that is first, they start by asking about you as a person with a very in-depth consultation. Pros ask me some pretty unexpected things like what zip code do I live in? Like they ask about damage level, but they ask about eating habits. They understand that inside out nature of healthy hair, right? Next, they analyze all the answers and determine what a unique blend of ingredients should be in every product of my custom routine. And so basically we have get all those goals covered. And plus one thing I love, love, love about pros is not only are the products individual, custom to you, high, high quality, but they're also a carbon neutral certified B Corp. So pros is an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. So if you're not 100% positive that Pros is the best hair care you've ever had, they will also take back your products, no questions asked. You can't lose. So Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash hunter. That's pros, P-R-O-S-E, pros.com slash hunter for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. I listened to that same conversation just yesterday. So oh. it was with Deborah Tan and that's who you're thinking okay. of. Okay, it's great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I love her stuff. It's great. <laughs> We need a fact check for here yeah. on the Mindful Mama <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so um, what, from, from what you're saying, it's not just the expectation of obedience. I mean, you're talking about it, uh, adults as well. It's just, it's sort of understanding the rhythm of someone else's conversation mm -hmm. and, and response time and thought process. And, you know, that's, that's interesting. It's interesting to think in, in, in the context of adults. 
You know, some, some people may need a, a longer lag time to feel invited to respond, right? Yeah, yeah. It, I guess it goes back to that mindset of like curiosity and non-judgment, right? We talk, we talk about that mm. mindfulness mindset of curiosity and non-judgment. So immediately, sometimes I guess we go into a situation where we need to ask our kids something and, you know, someone might say, oh, yeah, I say my child's name and I'm waiting for 20 seconds and a whole bunch of thoughts pop in the head. Like, what's wrong with my child? What's wrong with me? They're disrespecting me. All of these explanations and stories kind of pop into our heads. And so the, you're saying pause for 10 or yeah. 20 seconds. Is This is a yeah. radical, wonderful tip. I love this. Can I ask you a question? This is great. Now, this is not going to happen for everybody all the time, right? right. We're going to, we're still going to like bark some orders and yeah, bark sure. and, and commands and, and all of those things. So they're not listening because of the way we're communicating. So are there some ways that we can get our kids through all the processes of the day without, um, without causing that so much resistance to what we're saying? Yeah. Well, so I just want to step back behind mm. that question. How do we get kids to do the things we need them to do? Because people hear, like people will hear, how do, how do we talk when kids, so to get them to, do, to, get them to listen, right? People yeah. use that word, listen. And what do they mean when they say listen? What they really mean is behave, right? Yes. Do what I say, right? And so if we're, to, if we're asking ourselves, so how do we get kids to behave? Then we, I, I think we first have to think about how our kids feel. Because excuse me, because there's a connection be between how kids feel and how they behave, right? In fact, there's a connection between how people feel and how people behave, right? Think about those moments in your parenting career when you're glad that you weren't on reality TV and <laughs> you barked at your kids or said something cutting, right? Those tend to be the times when we ourselves are not feeling our best. Maybe we're feeling pressured because we got to get out the door. We have an appointment or we, you know, we, have, <laughs> we have to be somewhere. Um, or we had an argument with our spouse or we're tired, like all of those reasons will feed into why we aren't our best selves. You know, at other times when we're feeling better, we'll handle those moments more gracefully. So, th so there's a connection between how people feel and how people behave. So if we want to help kids to behave better, it can help to pay attention first to how they feel. So that's why we start off by talking about the importance of accepting kids' feelings and acknowledging their feelings. And it always sounds so simple when I put it that way. You know, we should start by acknowledging feelings. And people say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I do that. But it's actually very hard to do in the moment, right? <laughs> you know, especially when we're in a rush. We don't, you know, and, or a kid says, I don't want to go to school. And we think, yeah, well, you have to. I mean, it's starting in 10 minutes. We have to go, right? So it's very easy to deny their feelings, especially when we have our own agenda. So, um, so that I actually like to start there first when we're, we're talking about how to get kids to do the things we want them to do. Let's first see if we can get them in the mood. Let's get, see if we can get them, you know, get them feeling better. So they're more likely to do that. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think of, 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 a, of an example we can use. Um, Say your 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 kid you your kid sees a spider and gets really upset and starts to have a, a total meltdown, right? And what do we want to say? We want to reassure them. We want to say, "Oh, that's nothing to get upset about, honey. It's just a little spider. It won't hurt you. It's probably more scared of you than you are of it." Like we want to use logic and explanation to you know to to calm this child down. But when we say those things, think about it. How likely is it that that child is going to say, "Oh"? I didn't realize, thanks, that's helpful. Okay, I feel better about it now, right? <laughs> so what can we do instead? We can acknowledge those, th those feelings with words. We can say, ooh, that spider looks really scary. You don't want it to get anywhere near you, right? And, and the reason I'm using that example is that there was recently a study published where they used that exact scenario. And Joanna, do you wanna tell them about that study? Why, sure. <laughs> I figured you were going there with that spider example because, <laughs> because I recently um, told Julie about this study um, where researchers took um, arachnophobic individuals and they exposed them That's to a me. large... 
by the way. Very <laughs> large <laughs> spider. Oh, me no. too. Me too. I didn't even like reading about it. And, and, you know, with one group, they said, oh, it's just a little spider going about its business. You know, uh, you know, it's more afraid of you than you are of it. Uh, it won't really hurt you. And, um, you know, they had them practice sort of these positive statements. And with another group, they really encouraged them to express their negative feelings in as strong a language as possible. You know, I hate that hairy thing. I don't want it on me. It's disgusting. It's, you know, terrifying. And what they found was that the individuals who expressed their strong, genuine negative feelings um, had less anxiety, they had less stress. And not only that, but in a in the next session, they were much more willing to get closer to the spider and much more relaxed about it, which is so counterintuitive to most of us. Uh, you know, we wouldn't think, you know, the fear is that if we if we give space for these negative feelings that will be adding fuel to the fire and, and making them bigger and making them worse. But in fact, those negative feelings, they don't go away when we dismiss them. What they do is they just sit in there, you know, and, and cause kids even more anxiety because now they know they're having this feeling that is completely unacceptable. And when we accept them, it actually helps kids, you know, let go of it a little bit and, and, and start and learn to relax and, and do perhaps, you know, what you're encouraging them to do. Uh, so that's, yeah. you know, that's a powerful thing to know. Um, so, you know, yeah. just for three quick examples, because not everybody has a hairy spider, um, you know, so instead of, yeah, I'd you like know, us when, to move on from this you know, example, when, personally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let's move away from the spider. Move away from the spider. La, la, la. You know, so instead, when your kid says, "I, you know, I hate my brother," you know, instead of saying, "Don't say that about your brother," you know, you love him. You know, you can say, "You sound really angry at your brother right now. Something he did really upset you." That's not going to make him feel more angry about his brother. That's actually going to make him feel less angry. Um, you know, when your kid is melting down about homework, we want to say, "You know, here, it's easy. I'll help you." Um, instead of saying that, you can say, oh, long division can be really frustrating. There's so many steps. A and that will actually make them, you know, give them a little more courage to face the task. Um, you know, if they're complaining about, you know, in missing a trip, you know, instead of saying it's, it's not such a big deal to miss a trip, you know, you'll go another time, um, you're overreacting. You know, you, you can say it's so disappointing to have a fever. You were really looking forward to that trip. Um, you know, that that's going to be what makes them have, you know, the feeling that they can handle that disappointment. Just the sense that someone else understands what they're going through. And really, it's what we would want for ourselves. You know, if, if we're upset about something, angry, disappointed, frustrated, we wouldn't want someone else to say to us, oh, that's nothing. You're overreacting. You know, we would want them to say like, oh, that's so upsetting. And that's what would make us feel better. That yeah, act of yeah. emotional generosity. You, you hear me, you see me, you get it. Yeah, that's what we want from our friends. Yeah. And then some, yeah, and sometimes then we turn around with our kids and we're like, no, we just just don't have those feelings. Sometimes people worry that that if um, that some some kids can like when we reflect back and we're empathetic about these feelings, some people worry that kids can get stuck in like a loop. Like some kids are like, mm. yeah, and it's terrible. And they get kind of go in like a downward spiral. What, what is your advice for when something like that happens? You know, I think that um, it's the delicate balance between how much to acknowledge feelings and how to help kids move on. Mm. And um, I, I you have to you have to sort of read your child. I I'm always reminded of a story that Joanna told me about Sam with the ice cream at the park. Do you, you know, I I can tell it, but you'll tell it better. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Joanna? <laughs> oh, he dropped he dropped his ice cream. You know the classic kid thing, and he was he was crying and wailing. And I said, Oh, you're so disappointed. You were looking forward to eating that. Um, you know, and and he was deep in the abyss of despair. And, um, you know, at, at one point after acknowledging his feelings, 
And I, I just felt like, you know, he needed a little leg up. He needed some help out of it. And I said, well, this is really bad news for us. But you know who it's good news for? It's good news for the ants. They're going to have a party. <laughs> and, and, and that sort of interested him. And he perked up a little bit. And, and then I said, well, you know, we're missing our sweet treat. What should we have when we get home? You know, what, what do you think? Should we, should we see if there's some ice cream in the freezer or do you want something else? And that's one way to help kids move on is to, after acknowledging feelings, um, you can give them a different way to look at it and a different perspective without denying that it's disappointing to them. And you can give them a choice. Uh, to help them move on you know so mm -hmm. if a kid is wailing about a, scr a scrape on his knee um, you say like oh that hurts even a little scrape like that can hurt so much and you didn't want that to happen and then you, you can say you know it's a good thing you know it's it's a good that skin knows how to heal itself and it grows back together it's some pretty smart skin you have there and you can say what kind of what kind of band-aid do you want? Do you want the plain one or do you want the one with the, the cartoon character on it? Aww. Or should we draw a little smiley face on it? Um, so, so again, I, I wouldn't start with the other perspective. I would always yeah. start with acknowledging feelings, but, but sometimes after you've acknowledged feelings, they might be open to a different perspective. And I think the choice is, is a great way to go. You know, oh, you don't want your mom to leave. You wish she would stay. <laughs> Do you want to wave to her from the door or the window? And then all of a sudden the kid's like, you know, like, let's run to the window. Let's wave like this. So give them something to do. Give mm. them something to think about and something to do. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. They definitely do it. It's really helpful. It will change your relationship with your kids for the better. It will help you communicate better. And just, I'd say communicate better as a person, as a wife, as a spouse. It's been really a positive influence in our lives. So definitely do it. I'd say definitely do it. It's so worth it. The money really is inconsequential when you get so much benefit from being a better parent to your children and feeling like you're connecting more with them. And, not feeling like you're yelling all the time or you're like, why isn't things working? I would say definitely do it. It's so, so worth it. It'll change you. No matter what age someone's child is, it's a great opportunity for personal growth and it's a great investment in someone's family. I'm very thankful I have this. You can continue in your old habits that aren't working or you can learn some new tools and gain some perspective to shift everything in your parenting. Are you frustrated by parenting? Do you listen to the experts and try all the tips and strategies, but you're just not seeing the results that you want? Or are you lost as to where to start? Does it all seem so overwhelming with too much to learn? Are you yearning for a community of people who get it, who also don't want to threaten and punish to create cooperation? Hi, I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, I want you to seriously consider the Mindful Parenting membership. You will be joining hundreds of members who have discovered the path of mindful parenting and now have confidence and clarity in their parenting. This isn't just another parenting class. This is an opportunity to really discover your unique, lasting relationship, not only with your children, but with yourself. It will translate into lasting, connected relationships, not only with your children, but your partner too. Let me change your life. Go to mindfulparentingcourse.com to add your name to the wait list, so you will be the first to be notified when I open the membership for enrollment. I look forward to seeing you on the inside. mindfulparentingcourse.com. A way to kind of channel that energy because yeah. kids are like every other human being. Kids have a natural negativity bias, like in the brain, like we all mm. have that, right? Like that's natural in the brain. So 
you know, humans have a tendency to kind of like downward spiral. So it, it's nice to interrupt that. But I, yeah. I absolutely agree with you that the acknowledgement has to come first. Like, I hear you. I see you. I accept your feelings. We were just talking about this today in a mindful parenting call. And she was saying, well, you know, he kind of gets like really deep and negative. Mm. And I, I said, you know, you, yeah, like you can listen to their, your child's feelings and you can also hold some space for yourself and say, Hey, I, I need a break. This is, you're, <laughs> you're feeling really bad. This is a tough moment. And if it keeps yeah. going, you know, just like, Oh, this is a lot to take on. I need a break. I'll come back in a few minutes and I'll check in on you. You know, we're allowed to take care of our own emotional health too yeah. as well um yeah so but what you're saying yeah. is like sure sure just you know can. your child like no, be aware of what's yeah. going on you know like it's it's about kind of a tune, tuning in in awareness to what's what's happening and acknowledging what's happening yeah. and sometimes as you said a kid might have more need more time to grieve than an adult could listen to them grieve yeah you know, so if my child is, you know, extremely, extremely upset that his balloon popped and he's going on and on about it, you know, I can listen to it only for so long before my mind needs a rest. And I might have to say to him, you know, I hear that you're still upset about that balloon popping. You know, I can't, I can't listen, you know, I can't talk about balloons anymore right now. I'm going to go in the kitchen and start making dinner. And, you know, you can come in and help me when you're ready. And again, here's another when you're ready. Yeah, um, you're right. inviting them to, you know, have their sad time and come out and you're not saying, you know, come on, you should be over it by now, yeah. but you're inviting them back when they feel that they are ready uh, and, and you're inviting them to, to self-regulate. So I have some more ex examples and questions for you, you guys, but I'm curious about you, Joanna, having grown up with Adele Faber as your mom who who wrote the original book on on all of this acknowledgement I, I mean I'm just like kind of curious like do you feel like there's so many of us who just have you know all these in insecurities about our feelings we sh shoot the second arrow about uh, to ourselves about like what's wrong with me that I'm feeling anxiety and all these different things I mean I guess you can't know because you only have your own experience but you know, I don't have a double like, blind study with a whole other. Jo <laughs> How secure are you, Joanne? <laughs> I'm so secure. Look at me here. I'm so secure. <laughs> I, I guess, you know what I want to, I, I, I want to turn it outward. Um, because who knows how secure am I, you know, 6.3. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of want to turn it outward and say, you know, well, how good am I at this stuff? You know, just naturally accepting people's feelings. And I feel like somewhat good. Sometimes it comes very, very naturally to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I actually had a parent say to me, oh, you should read this great book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, because it sounds just like you. You would love it. It's just <laughs> your style. And I thought, oh, I, I really am a natural. But sometimes there are still times when I feel like I'm not a natural. And especially if my kid is, you know, very frightened or hurt or disappointed. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me sometimes to go there because mm -hmm. I think we all want to protect our kids from hurt and disappointment. And sometimes my impulse is to say, you know, oh, it's not so bad. Don't worry. You know, you know, don't be upset about this. Um, you know, don't be angry about that. Uh, because, you know, who wants their kid to be upset or angry? I, I, the, the difference with me, I feel like, is that I know I have, I know in the back of my head, as I try to do that, my kid gets more and more agitated, like, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. <laughs> you know, this isn't working. And then I can switch gears. Um, I, I mean, it, I, I, I want to tell you a little quickie of a conversation I had with an adult friend where it was really hard for me to do these things that really come naturally, would come naturally to me. Um, my friend was on the phone with me and I was going to drive her to the hospital for some tests. And she was telling me, you know what I'm worried about? I'm worried that it's going to be the big C. And, and I just sort of felt a little chill. And, 
And I really felt like saying, it's not going to be that. Don't mm-hmm. even think it. And because I, you know, because I have the intellectual knowledge that I have about acknowledging feelings. And a lot of practice. Uh, yeah, I, I bit my tongue on that, but I had an urge to say it. I bit my tongue and I was just quiet. I'm sure there was one of those pauses in the conversation where she thought, like, is she still there? Um, and then I said, that's a really big worry to be carrying around. And, and she just gave this explosive, yes, in response. It is. And do you know what people say to me? They say, don't even think about it. Isn't that ridiculous? Mm. And, you know, I agreed with her that that was completely ridiculous. I mean, how could you not think about it? You know, all the time thinking in the back of my head, that's exactly what I was going to say. That's exactly what I stopped myself from saying. Um, So again, you know, sometimes it's natural. Sometimes it's not natural. Because it's hard. We just want to protect. We want to protect. Yeah. Sometimes it it just still feels counterintuitive, except when you when you hit it right, you get such a good response. Yeah, and then you know you're doing the right thing. Yeah, you're on the on the right track. Um, yeah. yeah, I appreciate that that story. And um, so don't be afraid, parents. You can always reassure after, mm-hmm. you know, after yeah. acknowledging the feelings. There's plenty of room yeah. for from for some reassurance. Um, sure. Uh, what so I have a scenario for you. A what do we how would you respond to like a four-year-old hitting a little sibling, like say an 18-month-old or something? Is the baby's annoying the bejesus out of this poor preschooler and the preschoolers run out of tools and is like whacking his little sister? What are some ways to more skillfully stop that action behavior i think before we say anything you know useful we have to separate them make sure this little one is protected i mean that's of course our first you know the first i'm going to go in and separate them but even then you know the language that we use is important it's not oh no honey no 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 you know you're not allowed to hit that child what you know like bad girl like all those things that are going through our head. You're talking about things that go through our head. We're like, stop. You know, we may actually yell, stop, because <laughs> we have to do something quickly if the, if the little one's going to get hurt. But, uh, you know, I, I think as, as we are able to reconnect our thinking brain to how we want to manage this, you know, as we separate them, we'll say, oh, that hurts your sister, or you, no hitting, or, you know, <laughs> you know, tell her, I don't like the crying or, you know, so I'm, I'm asking myself, what's happening for this child? I'm, I'm going to separate her first, separate them, you know, make mm-hmm. sure that little one's safe. But then I'm, I'm, I'm going to think about, okay, so what's going on for my four-year-old? Like, is it that the little one is like, I know with my kids, like just the little one would be crying or so noisy that the older one couldn't take it. Or is it that the little one's like wrecking their Legos, you know, and knocking mm-hmm. over their block tower. And then we want to give them this, what skills do we want the four-year-old to use when the one, one and a half year old is wrecking their creations, right? It's actually tricky to figure out how to manage that. We adults have trouble when the one and a half year old grabs our cell phones or our pens when we're working on something, right? So we want to we want to give them a, a, something to, that they can do instead of just telling them what they can't. So how we manage it depends on what the scenario is. We might say, oh, it's hard to have a little sister. You know, she wrecks your things, right? So now I'm acknowledging her feelings. What can we do so she doesn't wreck your tower? You know, and and a four year old might actually come up with an idea like let's put her in you know let's get her her own toys or can we give her a few of the broken pieces over here she won't know the difference (laughs) so that's the next step would be to you know first acknowledge first separate you know make them safe then acknowledge the the feelings of of this frustrated four-year-old and then give her something that she can do those you know if i those that's my outline of of what i how i would approach it and i just want to throw down here um a lot, of, a lot of parents would feel that if there's ever a situation where you want to punish a child, it's when a bigger kid actually hurts a little kid. Because come on, like how permissive can we be? You know, allowing this kind of thing goes against every fiber of our being. And, and I just want to point out that 
when a four-year-old who has, you know, limited skills of how to handle uh, an out-of-control two-year-old lashes out physically, you know, if you punish that kid, it's not actually making the two-year-old safer, you know, because what's the four-year-old doing after, after she's punished? You know, is she sitting there saying like, oh, wow, I'm going to be a lot nicer to my little brother next time. You know, now I realize my, my, you know, my evil ways. You know, she's, she's probably really stewing with, with resentment and saying, you know, it's not fair. Mom likes her better than she, than she likes me. And, you know, he always gets away with anything because he's a baby. And next time I'm going to pinch him when mom's not looking. Um, so if we actually want to lessen the anger and lessen the violence, um, instead of just react, this is bad, this is violence, so I'm going to hit you. Um, if we actually want to bring down the heat and make the older child feel more fondly towards the younger child, it's what's really going to help is to start by acknowledging feelings. Boy, it's not easy to have a little, a little brother around. They're always getting into your stuff. And what can we do next time? And, and start them thinking about, you know, how can we protect your stuff without hurting your brother? I can't let you hurt him, but how can we protect your stuff? You know, that's, that's the kind of attitude and thinking we want to inculcate, you know, in the child. And that's the kind of attitude and thinking we want them to have as an adult is yeah. not to lash out in violence, but to think about, oh, gosh, I'm feeling so upset about this. What can I do to fix mm -hmm. the situation or what can I do so it doesn't happen next time? And the feeling that the parent is on their side in this and working with them is going to help them really calm down and be able to think about that. Yeah. Cause they won't be able to use their whole brain when they're, they're all activated and they can't learn in that moment. So when you're acknowledging those feelings, I love that, how you mentioned this idea of when they're older, you know, what's going to happen, you know, when you're not there, what you're practicing with them then can happen on their own. Like then we can acknowledge our own feelings and say, ah, oh, I'm really upset right now. This is a stinky situation. What can I do? Right. You know, like yeah. that's what we need as adults. And if we train in that as kids, it becomes that much easier. I hope. <laughs> so, so you can see it as an opportunity. You know, you can, you don't have to just look at it as, Oh, I'm putting out a fire in the moment. You can say, Hey, this is a wonderful opportunity to teach my kid how to solve problems and think about what kind of solution will respect everybody's needs. Because, you know, that's what the work of, of growing up is, is to, you know, figure out how to, how to relate socially with other people and protect your own needs and respect other people's needs. Um, you know, I know it's hard to think of that as an opportunity, but it is, you know, it is. It is. Yeah. They're learning yeah. from every moment that we are in, you know, everything they're watching us the whole time, right? Yeah. Like whatever we're modeling that becomes, that's the norm. That's the norm in their world. Yeah. So if we can model acknowledging feelings and, you know, not suppressing them, if we can not, and model like solving problems rather than, you know, punishing and causing that resentment, then, you know, they're, they're learning how to do that, which is, awesome. That's an awesome opportunity. Awesome. It's a life skill. Yeah. And it, it may help to know for us that, that toddlers and preschoolers, for them, it is extremely normal to get frustrated and lash out physically. You know, that is, you know, what happens at that stage of life as their brain is developing. So it may help us to know like, oh, my child is not a monster. You know, I don't, I don't need to, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's normal. When it didn't come this from is me. this is yeah, they're they're they are learning. This is their process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember thinking, like, why is my child hitting like she doesn't they <laughs> don't see hitting in my household? And yeah, it's just it's so, so normal. I, I can underscore that for Joanna. Before we let you guys go, whining. Oh, oh, you're gonna ask us about wine. Oh, what do we do about wine? <laughs> well, <laughs> I lost my consciousness. There we go. So, 
you know, whining, let's think about it. What, what is whining? You know, it's, it's a type of survival tactic. So, you know, very young children are dependent on us parents, right? And they have to get our attention to let us know what they need. And when they're little babies, right, they naturally do that by crying. And it's very hard to, um, you know, withstand the cry of a baby without the powerful urge to do something, right? And, um, so when they get old enough to talk, that cry becomes a whine, right? And now it's accompanied by actual words. Mom, I'm thirsty, right? Or I'm tired. God, so give me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> okay, I'll stop because you heard it. I know. I actually <laughs> suspect that if we could do a little sort of physiological test, we would find that we have a you know, physiological response to whining. I think it actually gets our attention in a certain way that other kinds of talk doesn't, right? So like uh, almost every kid at some point is going to experiment with whining. Um, it's, it's hard not to whine when you're feeling dependent. So Joanne and I have this thought experiment in, in our new book where we ask parents to imagine that you're out shopping with your spouse or your partner and you are in the department store and you, you're, you're, you're there to buy a toaster, but you see this green shirt hanging on the rack and you think, that's the exact color I need it's perfect. I have these pants and I have this work thing next week and I, I need, I, it would be per, the perfect outfit. And oh my gosh, it's on sale. So you say, honey, I need to get this, this shirt. And your, your, your spell says, uh, 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 we know we are here to buy a toaster that is not in the budget. We had this conversation already. We're not buying clothes today. Right. And you, and so think about how you, how you feel and how you say, but honey, it's on sale. It's perfect. We have to get it today. Cause it's like, you know, I need, it. <laughs> I need it. Right. Our voice goes up. We start to whine. Right. Cause we feel like I have to convince them somehow. I don't, I don't have the power just to say I can do it. I have to convince this other person. So, okay. So that's, that's often why kids whine. That's, I think it's really important for us to, uh, to sort of be able to relate to it first. And then of course that leads us to the question. So how can we respond when a kid is whining? Um, Joanna, you wanna? <laughs> okay, okay. So, so thinking about that state of dependency, um, one of the skills in our book is put the child in charge. So one thing we can do is to make them feel less dependent. And, and you know, this really struck me about the whine because my, my oldest child, I, I think he whined for like a split second. Um, I never remember him whining and I thought it was because I was a great mom, but I, I don't think it was after I had my second child. Um, but you know, one feature of Dan was that whenever he wanted something, he would get it. So if he wanted water, you know, he would, you know, climb up on the counter and stand up and open the cabinets and go get it. And then he would climb up on the refrigerator shelf. And, you know, he, he was a real go getter. And then I had the second child who had not only a mom to take care of him, but an older brother to take care of him. So when he wanted something, you know, I found, you know, oh my goodness, I have a whining child. Um, so uh, one of the things that I would do is to say, well, I would, I would use two different skills. One is I would try to tell him what he can do instead of what he can't, because kids aren't very good at just not doing something. So sometimes I would say, you know, Sam, you know, can you ask me, I like to be asked in, in your deepest voice, you know, mom, can I have some water, please? And I'd be very gravelly. And, you know, sometimes he would do that. And, but sometimes he wouldn't be in the mood to do that. And I would say, well, if you're not in the mood to do that, you can get it yourself. You know, there's a stool and you can, and I would put, you know, things in small containers so that he could get them himself and just spill only the amount of liquid that I was willing to clean up. And, and I started putting a lot of um, things on lower in the kitchen on lower shelves and in lower cabinets so the kids could get themselves their own snacks when they were hungry and pour themselves their own milk. And, um, you know, and sometimes you could sort of see the light go on his eye. Oh, I can do that myself. I don't have to sit here and, you know, <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it creates more mess. But you know, hey, you didn't have kids to have a not messy life, right? 
and and what you're doing is you're creating this independent kid. So at one point, you know, you are free to go. They really can take care of themselves. They can, you know, get their own food. They can, they can, you know, all three of my kids were very big at cooking and preparing. And now it's another thing to get them to clean up after themselves. Um, and I'll give you one more uh, example of putting the child in charge that's not around food. In my house, we're all very food oriented. But I've heard from a lot of parents who uh, get upset about their kids wanting to bust the budget, you know, because they want some kind of designer clothing and they'll whine for that. And, and parents tend to get sort of morally outraged that their kids want to spend, you know, three times as much as you need for a pair of boots just because it has the puffy little fur on top that everybody else is wearing. Fake fur. Um, so, you know, I would suggest for that kid put them in charge of the budget, you know, first acknowledge feelings, you know, you can tell your kid, you know, oh, you really like that kind of boot, you know, it's so cool and it has the puffy little fur thing on the top and all the other kids have it. Um, you know, here's our budget for clothes for, for the fall. You know, we need two new, you need two new pairs of pants. You need a pair of boots that will be good in the snow. Um, and it's got to come in for under X number of dollars. You know, do you want to, you know, do you want to go shopping with me or do you want to go look on, on the internet and see what you can find and, you know, make it be, make it be their responsibility. Then they can start comparing prices and looking for sales instead of having us always in the hot seat, having to say, no, 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 that's too expensive. Uh, so that's another way to, to help kids be uh, less dependent and less whiny and also give them a whole practice with a whole array of life skills. I'll stop there. I love that. I love that. that this insight that it's about dependency is, is really helpful um, because, yeah, and, and the voice of her like, can you ask me that in your normal voice, please? <laughs> um, yeah, but the fact that it's about de dependency is, is really important. And, um, uh, and Joanna and Julie are describing uh, setting your cell, your house up for that. Um, and we have a great episode on that with, um, Lorena Seidel called create your optimal home environment. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but if you want to oh, listen for that one, you nice. can listen for that one too. Um, oh my gosh, you guys, I could talk to you. About, <laughs> I feel like someday we're going to have like a conference and we're going to just hang out and like have drinks at the end of the day and, and just, chat right. that suggests that we would be there in person yeah i think we should do that i'll i'll have yeah. you come to my mindful parenting conference when i have my next in-person conference you'll be like my big name stars that'll come Ooh. <laughs> in, in this world which is so cool um open world yeah it, now just briefly is there anything that we you know that we could talk there's so many things that we could talk about is there anything that we miss that you were dying to to talk about today and share with the listener? Um, I would just want my final words to be, you know, we give our kids a million chances and then two more, you know, give your own self a million chances and then two more. Don't, don't be, don't be your own harshest critic. Um, Amen. Dr. Gannat, my mother's mentor, Dr. Chaim Gannat, he, he used to say, no one could do this stuff all the time. We aim for 70%. Uh, oh, oh, I forgot his, his best line. He would say, you know, with this, with this approach, you don't have to be orthodox. You can be reform. <laughs> you, we aim for 70%. Some days 50% we, is all we can manage. And sometimes even 10% can make a real difference in a relationship. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really appreciate those words because we've got a lot of overachievers in our, in our, as the listener, you know, I'm talking about yeah. you. All right. <laughs> so I, I have a challenge for the overachievers. <laughs> My final word. Um, we talked today about the challenge of getting kids to do things without telling them directly, without, you know, ordering them around or commanding them, you know, put that down, get your shoes on. So my challenge to your listeners would be to see how long you can go without issuing a command. Mm. Like actually time yourself and then email us and tell us how long did you go? <laughs> We're collecting statistics. Oh, Julie, give them our email and our website. Oh, yes. We, we have a brand new website. 
it's how dash to dash talk.com. So it's the words how to talk.com, but with dashes between the words, how dash to dash talk. And if you want to write to us, you can write to us at info at how dash to dash talk.com. And we'd love to hear from your, your listeners or, or watchers. I guess you have listeners and watchers. <laughs> Both now. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. You guys are amazing. I love you. I love having you come on the podcast and hearing your your words of wisdom. And I appreciate it so much. So go check out their new book, How to Talk When Kids Won't Listen. I'll, I'll have my little visual here, right up here. And it's fabulous. It's going to be on my recommended reading list of mindful parenting. And I love it. So, and I appreciate what you're doing for the world and how you're helping parents so much. It's, it's a real gift. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming on today and sharing with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. I love how Joanna and Julie recommend this playfulness and this level of lightness and playfulness and that's really really what we need with little kids it's so true we have to kind of step into their world a little bit and and of course to be able to do that really requires that we are able to step out of the adult stresses and calm our nervous system stop the incessant like what to do list you know go 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 mind and be able to be really present it also requires that we start to uncover some of those unconscious triggers that may be driving us to get really upset at some of the little th the things that little kids do and you know take care of our own emotions so that is all the work that we do in the mindful parenting course as well as teaching you the powerful fundamentals of skillful communication for every single age, uh, even 11 and 14 year olds like mine. So it, it really, really brings together all the things you need. If you're interested and you wanna know more, go to mindfulparentingcourse.com, get on the wait list, we'll let you know when we open the doors, we'll give you more information, the Mindful Parenting Manifesto, and then you can join. We have a lifetime membership where you get 36 hours of parent coaching every year for as long as you need it. It's an incredible value because that parent coaching generally costs like $200 an hour. So that times 36, I mean, I don't know what that is, like $8,000 a year worth of parent coaching that you get plus the course, plus all the bonuses. It's really, really an incredible value. But we also have an affordable self-study version. So if you want to know more, you're ready to take that step, if you're ready to step into the possibility of what is possible if you start to transform those things, go to mindfulparentingcourse.com. Just get on the wait list. We'll give you information. Check it out. See if it's for you. Thank you so much for listening. I'd love to hear your takeaways. I hope this has been a helpful episode. Just as a housekeeping, we're going to be pausing, taking a break on the season of our the Mindful Parenting Minis on Fridays. So I would say re-listen to this one. There's so much to learn here from Joanna and Julie. It's so great. So hope it has helped you. Hope it will bring some more playfulness and cooperation into your life this week. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here, sharing your time with me. I hope you're subscribing and sharing this with friends so they can also benefit and we can share it with more of the world. And I appreciate your ears, your time, and you being part of this movement to, to transform the way we parent. It really can make such a huge impact on the world together. So I'm psyched about that. Have a great week, my friend. Namaste. Do you have any advice for people on how to talk to their kids? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's your job, not mine. Okay, all right, fair enough.